Well, it's always nice to gather on Sunday morning, amen? We get to encourage one another, we get to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, and we get to focus on on His Word. And I know that God has a special purpose uh, for today's service. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's bow in a word of prayer before uh, I bring the Word. Jesus, we thank You. We come here today, Lord, with hearts that are open and asking God that you would, you would speak to us through your word, Lord. And Father, I pray that you'd help me to explain this in a way that would be understood by everyone and that your Holy Spirit would just take the words in my mouth. And, and Father, that we'd be able to apply all these things practically in our lives. We thank you for the book of James and God, we thank you for your blessing upon it. And we pray uh, that you would just help everyone here to have a great day. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, last week, being Easter Sunday, I took a break from the uh, series um, that I've been speaking on in the book of James. And today, I'd like to get back into that series. Um, we're in the middle of James. We left off in the middle of James chapter 3. So if you've got your Bibles here with you, or if you want to follow along on the overhead, or if you've got your phone Bible. Um, We're going to be starting this morning's message with James chapter 3, verse 13. James writes this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So in in verse 13, James continues to speak um, with the believers, and the context of chapter 3 of James, um, James is addressing people who are or who are aspiring to be teachers in the church. He's already brought up the fact that, um, that people needed to be very careful about becoming teachers because they're going to be held to a higher standard of accountability And as I stated in my message two weeks ago, it's not as though you should not become a teacher. Now, if you're called by God to be a teacher, you should be one. And and you should should be uh, trusting that the Lord will give you what you need to uh, teach in a way that uh, pleases Him and honors Him. But the responsibility of being a teacher in the kingdom of God, it needs to be approached very carefully. Um, it, and very seriously, because teachers, as we know, they impact the lives of, uh, of so many other people, either for the good or, or for the bad. And, and when we are in step with God's Spirit, we're, if, when we're in step with the Holy Spirit, our tongue is like a spout, and, and it, it can either spout refreshing words that, that brings life to other people around us, with a spirit-led tongue, we bless the Lord. Like we were singing this morning, we, we bless the Lord. And we encourage others through what we say. And the Bible says that we shouldn't forsake the gathering of ourselves together so that we can encourage one, or one another daily as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So the tongue is a spokesperson for what is within my heart. And the same can be true on the flip side of that. When we yield to our sin nature with a tongue that's unyielded to God's Spirit, we can get ourselves in a big mess in a hurry, right? Like all of us have been here. Um, James teaches that the fire of hell actually ignites evil that comes through the tongue. So with an out-of-control tongue, we wind up being Rather than a, like a fresh spring, we, we end up being like a salty spring, spouting forth cursing, anger, discouragement to those around us, rather than um, blessing God and lifting other people up. This being said, displaying goodness, patience, kindness, and self-control in speech is not just important for teachers, it's important for every believer. The teachers are pointed out here because it's very important that they stay on track with this. But it's not like James is saying, oh, this is just for teachers and everyone else can just do whatever they want. 
No, he's saying the mark of God's Spirit in you ought to make a difference in how you speak. So we're moving on. Now, up to this point, James has been telling the followers of Jesus how to be exemplary in their speech. But he's going to move on here, and in verse 13 we see that he moves on to, to talk about not just how we carry ourselves when we speak, but also how we carry ourselves in our everyday living. As disciples of Jesus, through the saving work that Jesus did up on the cross for us, we've been redeemed and we're no longer slaves to sin. Isn't that a great, great fact? Isn't that good news? We're no longer slaves to sin. If we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, um, He moves in and, and He now is our Lord. Sin shall no longer be your master. For you're saved by grace, the grace of God. So, thankfully, we've been set free. And we're born again in the Spirit as the, as the Holy Spirit comes and takes his, his place in us. We're born again in the Spirit. But we all know this, right? There's a wrestling match that takes place in us because um, although we're redeemed sinners, the old nature passed down to us from Adam, it still, it still wants control and it's very stubborn. It still wants to dominate us and to lead us to sin. Why? Well, because there's desires within that nature that are contrary to the Lord. Desires within our sin nature that want to be our own God. Des desires that are, are whispered into us from the outside through the world, uh, the flesh, and the devil as well, right? If we're not walking in step with the Holy Spirit, we quickly find ourselves tempted to walk in our old nature and to fall prey to sin. And this is why James tells us um, in verse 2 of chapter 3 that we all stumble in many ways. So for, be, for us to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk, we need more than just good human insight and, and willpower, human willpower, to overcome the, the influences of the world around us, our own flesh and, and the temptations that come from the enemy. We need supernatural assistance. We need insight from the Holy Spirit. Our fleshly minds need to be renewed and transformed by God on a daily basis. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, he says to the church in Rome, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So in other words, what do we need? We need heavenly wisdom. You might say that wisdom is defined as the right application of, of knowledge. In John 17, 14 to 17, Jesus, as, as God the Son, he was praying a priestly prayer to God the Father on behalf of his disciples. And, and Jesus prayed to the Father, saying, This I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as, the, as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So in these passages, Jesus communicates two important facts. Firstly, God, God's Word is truth. When you look at the Word of God, it equals truth. 
And it's by that truth that God sanctifies us or sets us sanctification as being set apart for holy service to God. When God sanctifies us, as believers, when we come to know Him, there's an instantaneous sanctification that occurs as God, as God works immediately in our lives, but, but sanctification is also a process that, that takes an entire life. You know, all of us here, we're, we're not perfect, are we? It says that in James. He says that. We all stumble in many ways. We need God's grace actively on a day-to-day basis to help us to grow, to be like Him and, and to grow so that we can offer ourselves in holy service to Him. We can't do this in ourselves. We need God's Spirit to help us. So, what does this mean? It means regarding being set, a, set apart for holy service to God, we can know everything about what the Bible says about how we should be living. We can study it and know it. Yet, we can be very weak in the application of these principles that are taught us in everyday life. We need heavenly wisdom to help us understand the proper context that the Word of God is speaking to us in. We need heavenly wisdom to know how to correctly apply God's Word and its, His teachings to everyday circumstances. James gives us a test here as to whether we are living out heavenly wisdom or not. He asks the question, he asks this question, who is wise and understanding among you? And rather than giving us a straight answer to that question, uh, James infers that the answer may be found through honest reflection. Through honest reflection on what one actually lives like in your world. How do you live? Essentially, this question is, who is wise and understanding? He's asking us to reflect on how we live practically. In other words, the proof is in the pudding. The gospel is not meant to be something that tickles our ears. It's meant to be something that transforms us to be new creatures, to be redeemed creatures, to be creatures that shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to a world that is lost and is dying without truth. They're blinded. They can't see. And you are the light of the world. Why? Because God has called you into partnership with him. It's beautiful. James tells us, who is wise and understanding amongst us? He asks the question. Then he says, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So let's stop and think about this for a second. So if wisdom is the right application of knowledge, then heavenly wisdom shows its presence when we give, or, and, when we, we give and we serve and we live a life that is humble and is other-centered. You see, we're not just living as Christians, or at least we shouldn't be, and James is asking this question, we need to evaluate our hearts, each one of us, every day, because there's a lot of deception out there, and we can get sidetracked very quickly, can't we? You see, we're not just to live a good life, to show other people how good we are, by doing good things. We're, we're not just living a good life to feel good about ourselves. Living a good life simply for the sake of getting a, an ego boost, it's not a mark of the presence of heavenly wisdom. In verses 14 and 15 of our text, James calls believers to evaluate whether they possess heavenly wisdom and understanding or not. This is a time, I think when we read God's Word, we should be open to what the Spirit is trying to say to us. So I'm, I'm challenging you, I'm challenging myself, because we're all in this together, to open our hearts and ask ourselves whether we're on track with this or not. 
If we can honestly say that we're living a good, holy lifestyle with a really humble attitude, then we're on track, but sometimes we get off track, don't we? He says here in verse 14, James says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Analysis of my motives for doing what I do, it's a healthy practice. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. See if there be anything in me that's contrary to what you would have, Lord. Lead me in the way that I should go. Forgive me if I get off track, Lord. So, analyzing daily is a good practice. The worldly wise person, they analyze their environment. And they come up with a plan to maximize how they can personally benefit from that, from their environment. But as a Christian... As a Christian, I adopt a different attitude. If I adopt this attitude of selfish ambition, this selfish attitude, then I will gravitate. I'm going to gravitate towards being envious of giftings or abilities that God has given to other people. James recognizes that some of his re readers are, are harboring what he calls bitter envy and, and selfish ambition. In other words, it, it's apparent that some believers have been corrupted by, in, in other words, selfish and sinful zeal. The Greek word for envy in this case is zelon. And zelon is often used to de describe, it's used to describe fanatical zeal for a cause. So James, in this case, is suggesting that some of his readers might be priding themselves in their enthusiastic defense of the truth. This is a very touchy point because every time we make decisions, we're making decisions on our attitude as well, right? And... Uh, you, we can be enthusiastic about defending truth, but if that enthusiasm is not formulated to bring ultimate glory to God through my life, it's a defense that's formulated and generated out of selfish zeal for the purpose of personal advancement. It's possible to be bitterly envious of other workers in God's kingdom, isn't it? If we let our heart go to the flesh. Yeah, you, you can get very jealous of, uh, of other people's giftings and what's going well with them and then try to match them. Living in the realm of selfish ambition and sinful envy, I now enter this competition with other people to prove that somehow I am important. You heard this statement of, you know, I have really low self-esteem. I'm here to say that as a believer, our esteem cannot be on what I do, what I can offer. If, if I'm holding on to that model where I am looking inward to find uh, my footing, inward to find my truth, rather than looking to the Lord Jesus Christ and casting myself down before Him. Because, you know, without Jesus, we're not going to get it right. We're not going to. So, if I'm developing skills and abilities to, and seeking positions of power simply so that I can elevate my self-worth, I'm in the wrong spot in my spirit. We've got to be careful. This is very subtle. It can work its way in to us very subtly. This is why James is bringing this up. So if I'm taking pride in myself and I'm excelling or I'm pouring my ministry energy into the ministry uh, so that I can 
bolster self-perception? I really need to recognize this as a lie. I'm not displaying heavenly wisdom, and I need to repent. I'm sorry, God. I'm looking at this the wrong way. It's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about any of us. It's about the glory of God as servants of Christ. We are no longer our own. We've been purchased with the the precious blood of Jesus. He's called us and separated us and put us on a new track. And he calls us to work with him in his kingdom purposes. He doesn't need me to be a pastor. He doesn't need you to do whatever it is that God's gifted you to do. He doesn't need you, but he calls you because he wants to involve you with his work because it gives him joy to pour his love and affection onto you and to see you pour out onto other people and to, and to, and to show other people his love that he's given to you. That's what it is. So, hmm. Um, in any case, I need to cease. If I'm having a problem with this, I need to stop it right now. Identify it. If the Spirit speaks to me about it and draws it out and says, I, you need to deal with a son or daughter, I need to stop right now. I need to recognize the lie that I've swallowed and uh, repent. And this is why James says, do not boast about it. Like, oh, I, I do this and I do that. No, it's not about what I do. My faith rests in the character, unshakable character of Christ not in what I can bring to the table. Don't boast about it or deny the truth. World's wisdom is all about promoting self, isn't it? I mean, we learn this. I mean, goodness, I was a policeman, and when you get promoted in the police world, they want you to tell them how good you are with all these competencies, right? you got to fill out these forms and write big, long paragraphs about the good things that you've done and how you meet the qualifications for this job. You're just bolstering. It, it's, this is the world's wisdom. I'm not saying that we don't analyze where we're going. I mean, in this world, you've got to live in this world. You're going to have to fill out job applications. You're going to have to say, yeah, I can do this or whatever. But it, at the heart of it, at the very heart of it, does that carry over? into my life as a believer? Because we can let it. Am I, is my zeal for the Lord truly spiritual? Or, or in reality, is, is it carnal? Do I rejoice when I see brother so-and-so excel? Do I, am I happy for them? Or do I secretly go, I wish I had that? Right? This is the litmus test right here. The selfish ambition part of this says, get all the support that you can get right now. Ask people whether they're for you or against you. Get the support. This creates nothing but rivalry. Selfish ambition creates nothing but rivalry and causes division wherever it shows its face. Such wisdom in verse 15, the, James says, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual. In fact, he goes further, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So the worldly wisdom that comes from earthly sources, which are weak and, and imperfect, this bitter arrogant so-called wisdom, it's very, re, it's very much different than a real wisdom, which is heavenly wisdom. It's unspiritual because it comes from our, our sin nature. It's rooted in the soul and, and it does not have its source from the Holy Spirit. Animal reasoning, I guess you might call it, kind of wisdom that makes an animal snap and snarl. You ever find yourself snapping and snarling when, you, when it doesn't go the right way? 
Hmm. This kind of wisdom has no other thought but hunting prey or, or uh, personal survival. It's demonic because it stoops to actions that resemble the prideful, contentious behavior that characterize demons contrary to the life of the born-again saint whose chief aim and calling is to glorify God with everything I am and everything that I have. It's all His. That's, that's what God calls you as a saint. You're a saint because the blood of Jesus has covered your sin and has cleansed you from all unrighteousness. The Spirit of God has, has taken away your sin. Sometimes we forget that we've been cleansed from our sins. And then we start to live like we, we haven't been cleansed from our sins. God has paid the price. Jesus paid the price on the cross for your sin. You don't have to go there anymore. Accept that grace and experience freedom. That's heavenly wisdom. So, in our Bible study this week, we, stu we studied how selfishness is at the root of evil behavior because selfishness is all about self-promotion. It's all about self-preservation. And it really doesn't care about anybody else, does it? That selfish motive actually is looking out for number one. And that's, that's promoted all over the place. Look out for number one and you'll succeed in life. Leaning on the wisdom of the world, the flesh and the devil. You know, it might make us uh, able to accomplish things at first, but it's not going to go very far. As a believer in Christ, it's going to end and it always bears the fruit of unrest, division, and strife. Always. That's where it leads to. So, James contrasts the bitter, arrogant wisdom of the sinful man with true wisdom. So he talks about worldly wisdom, and now he talks about true wisdom, heavenly wisdom. But the wisdom, in verse 17, that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Heavenly wisdom. It's pure. It's not corrupted by sinful attitudes or, or motives. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't have its source in us. It has its source in God. It's peace-loving. It brings people closer together and also closer to God. Now there's a kind of wisdom that finds delight in hurting people with clever and cutting words. We've seen that before. Have you ever been hurt by clever and cutting words? Have I ever hurt someone with clever and cutting words? Oh yeah, I admit it. You have too probably. That's the antithesis. That's, that's the worldly wisdom where we're trying somehow to make ourselves look better and someone else look worse. And it can even be subconsciously. The antithesis of heavenly wisdom is this criticism, this cutting. James criticizes, in this case, false claims to wisdom. Because the wisdom that comes from that source is contentious and it causes disputes wherever it, it finds itself spawning. In 2 Timothy 2.14, Paul gives Timothy some wise advice and this falls in line with what James has to say in our passage here. And, and Paul says to Timothy in verse 14 of 2 Timothy 2.14, Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. And in 2 Timothy 2, 23 and 24, he says, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, 
able to teach, not resentful. Heavenly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom is gentle. It, it, it does not stir conflict. It's considerate of other people and how they feel. In, in other words, a heavenly wise person is a gentleman if you're a man and a gentlewoman if you're a woman. Gentleness. Albert Simpson, one of the founders of the Alliance Church Movement, he said this, he said, the rude, sarcastic manner, the sharp conduct, the sharp retort, the unkind cut, all of these have nothing whatever in common with the gentle teaching of the comforter. So God's wisdom brings comfort. It builds up. It's also submissive and full of mercy. If we possess this wisdom, we will be open to sound reason. We'll be humbly able to admit it when we've made a mistake. We make mistakes all the time. It's part of the sanctification process that God's working on us on. You, you and I, if we're honest with ourselves, we blow it sometimes, right? And we hurt other people. You know, we hurt, our, we hurt people that are close to us. We hurt people that we don't even realize we hurt. God wants us to recognize these things and just bring it to Him. And if we need to make something right with someone that we've hurt, then we need to do that. We will be able to concede to the truth when we recognize that we're wrong. If God's wisdom, if God's wisdom is at the helm of the ship of our lives, it will steer us towards being merciful towards other people who have strayed, who have fallen down, who have done wrong. This is why Jesus was a friend of sinners and tax collectors, because his heart was open to them, and he desired them to see him as a God who would forgive them and who would bring them to, to wholeness. And the Pharisees, they put their nose up, didn't they, at Jesus when he went and fellowshiped with these people. And Jesus said, hey, I'm not, after, I'm not after people who are well here. I'm after people who need a doctor. And if we're all honest with ourselves, all of us need the doctor. We need our heavenly doctor to help us, to fix us, to restore us, to renew our mind on a daily basis. God's wisdom. Mercy is shown because we recognize when we show mercy, we recognize that others need mercy from us because after all, God showed us more mercy than we deserve. What did we deserve before we came to know Christ? What did we deserve? We would deserve wrath. The wrath of God. He extended mercy to us and gave us grace to save us from ourselves. Should we not also be like-minded to Christ and extend mercy to others who have done things to us? Just like Jesus did? Heavenly wisdom says, yes, it's merciful. It also keeps no records of wrongdoing. It sets us free. You know, there's something beautiful about just being able to let something go. You know, if you're holding on to something that's deep down in your spirit and you just let go, G Jesus will set you free. A and it's like your burdens are lifted. There's that old song, burdens are lifted at Calvary. At Calvary, at Calvary the place where Jesus paid the price. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. When we go before Jesus and we say, Lord, take this. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to resolve it. Forgive me for my attitudes. Even if I'm right, 
Forgive me for my attitudes against those who have done wrong to me. And we can all apply that in so many different circumstances. No records of wrong. It forgives. It's humble. And I think Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 23 exp expresses this. Expresses and, and, and ha hammers out what heavenly wisdom is all about. In Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 23, it talks about the acts of the flesh and then talks about what it is like when we encounter heavenly wisdom. So the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, there it is, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, kind of love. Write that down if you don't know what that is. I challenge you to look at that. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. In essence, what James and Paul are saying in these scriptures to us this morning is that a truly wise person with God's wisdom manifests the life of Jesus Christ both in the fountain of speech and in the works of their hands. The one who displays heavenly wisdom is the one of whom the fruit of the Spirit is evident. And the fruit of the Spirit's mark, friends, the fruit of the Spirit's mark is the very presence of the Holy Spirit within us. The Bible says that if we don't have the Spirit of Christ, then we're none of His. If we don't have the Spirit of Christ, we need to come to Him and say, Jesus, please forgive me. I don't know how to help myself. I'm in a real mess here, and I just need you to take away my sin. And if somehow we've been misled down the garden path by our flesh, by the worldly system out there, or an enemy, a devil, or his demonic entities that are trying to steer us away from closeness with God and closeness with each other, we can come to the Lord today in repentance and say, God, forgive me. He's faithful. He's just to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from unrighteousness and to draw us close. Draw me nearer, precious Lord. Draw me nearer to you so that I can see as you see, so that I can hear as you hear, so that I can do as you would have me to do. That can happen. You don't have to be distant from God. Maybe you're prodigal. You've gone a long ways away from your home. You're still a child of God, but you're a long ways away. You can come close. You can come back. He's not going to turn you aside. He's not going to let you figure it out on your own. He's going to be there with arms open wide to bring you in. If you've never been part of the Father's house, I'm telling you, God loves you. And he wants you to, to be at one with him. That's what the cross is all about. Paying the price for our sin. Taking the death penalty on himself instead of it falling on us. You can be freed. And when you're freed from your sins, spiritually, you come alive because the Holy Spirit comes and he makes his presence in you. People say, I was talking to someone the other day, person 
broke my heart. He says, I don't believe anything. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. It's my personal choice. And I, I tried to talk with him a little bit, and he's like, no, that's just your thing. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever so they can't see the glory of God. But the Spirit does call out, and as many as would receive him to them, gives he the power to become the sons of God. If you're listening online today, and you're, you're saying, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but something's got to change. I can tell you right now, Jesus Christ came to change your life. All you have to do is believe and receive him as your Savior. And when you do, he will change your life. He'll set you free from the chains that have bounded, bonded you. So, concluding Mark remark today. God calls us, for those of us who believe, calls us to walk in step with the Spirit, to yield to the Spirit, and ask that the Spirit would lead us as we walk with Him to do what is right before Him. And if you feel like you just haven't had the wisdom in play, that's okay. Now is the time where you can just say, God, I, I need to get right. I need to come back to where I was. As James puts it in James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That's a promise in God's word. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the promise of the Lord this morning. Would you bow with me and uh, music team if you'd come. Lord, we come to you. God, you, you know the world that we live in. It's so tangled and messed up. And God, even our own hearts sometimes lead us astray and we wrestle with the, our nature passed from Adam to us. Lord, we wrestle with that. and We also wrestle, wrestle against an enemy that wants to see us wants to see us reduce our effectiveness for your kingdom's sake. Wants to see us hurting. Wants to see us ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of you. God, I just pray if there's someone here today that needs just to surrender and, and let go, that you would just move in that person or people. That they would just let go and and just let your forgiveness flow. They come close. They come back to their first love. And for those that don't know you, Lord, I pray that they would, they would seek you. And you will find the Lord if you seek him with all your heart, if you ask him to be your savior. And you, you turn away from the worthless things that are not of him. Lord, we just thank you for this day that you have made we ask that you would bless us as we go downstairs to enjoy dinner and fellowship together. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. If there's anybody that wants to stay and pray, the prayer room is open. And if you feel like you just need to have some prayer, that would be awesome. God bless you.